Peter Felton, one of the authors of Engaging Students as Partners in Learning and Teaching, a guide for faculty, spoke with a McMaster audience on February 10th, 2014, about building the student-teacher partnership. When faculty study student learning, faculty become better teachers. The Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching agrees, and so do teachers. This was a transformative experience. It reconnected me with my love of and investment in teaching. It so teacher-student partnerships are becoming more common and more important. But why should teachers partner with students? How do we do it effectively and what are the results? If we think about teaching and learning from a faculty perspective as something we do to students, it's adversarial, it's difficult, we struggle. If we think about what we do with students, it's a whole different ballgame. In fact, when faculty and students partner, both sides of the partnership win. This is not just something we do to help students. This is something we do to help ourselves. Teachers and students bring different kinds of expertise to the partnership. Professors bring subject matter knowledge, while students deliver an understanding of what it's like to study in the age of the smartphone. Partners do not contribute the same thing, necessarily. But they do contribute. Right? It takes work for partners to develop trust and respect and to share risk and power. Dr. Felton provides simple, example-based advice on building those kinds of partnerships. So partnerships in designing, and it's, it's always a partnership of students and faculty. Our typical practice is to have at least twice as many students as we have faculty. Often we have someone from our teaching center who is part of the team and their job is to facilitate so that, especially in those first meetings, the faculty member isn't running the show. Number two. Partnerships in responding, and what I mean by that is live in class, small classes or big classes, how do we do partnerships? These kinds of partnerships exert their influence as the course is going on. They allow students to collaborate actively in interpreting and responding to different teaching approaches as they happen. It's all about checking in with the students. Number three. Partnerships in doing assessment, and in this case, getting towards grading. Dr. Felton describes how he partners with students to develop the marking rubric in one of his own graduate courses. Here's what the assignment is, your final assignment. Here's what my goals are. What do you think good work is going to look like on something like that? And so here were a list of things students said good work would look like. And then we sorted and prioritized those. And we came back to iteration three and we started creating a rubric. By iteration four, we had a rubric and that was the rubric I used to grade their work. And what was really interesting about this is they were then articulating the qualities of excellent work in the course, which is something you want graduate students to be able to do. Dr. Felton's fourth example is in what he calls inquiring, or exploring the process of teaching and learning itself. He focuses on a tool called the Think Aloud. In the Think Aloud, you use a camera and a person, and you get the person to do something, to do some task, and to talk about what he's doing as he's doing it. One test in a philosophy class discovered that the professional academics always read background materials, while students almost never did that kind of contextual thinking. So what's this mean? They started teaching in this department how to read a philosophy text. As a result, the professors completely revised the starting point of the course. Ultimately, it's not the tactics or techniques, but rather the outcome that counts. Partnerships are one approach that can get us towards a lot of the shared goals we actually have in higher education about being better teachers, having our students learn more, and helping us be better citizens.